Tomorrow, it will have been a uh, hundred years exactly that uh, this man here, Paul Wippler, a young uh, mathematical teacher at the Lycée du Mans, uh, received fatal wounds while building a footbridge over the Canal des Ardennes. His orders were to transform the temporary walkway in, built on cork floaters into a more permanent structure. A first projectile was, was fired at the working crew and injured two soldiers. Their work, they, they, still tar, they still continued their work and the work was coming to an end when another shot was fired and hit a dense group of workers. One was killed on the spot, six were injured, including Wippler. The next day, in a field hospital, Wippler wrote his family, a slight mishap just happened to me. I was hit in the back by shrapnel that was taken out this morning. Everything is going well. The recovery, the recovery however, was slow. The armistice on November 11 rejoiced him. The next day, he went to surgery once again. On the morning of the 17th, he wrote with a hand made shaky by his silent suffering, this is a nice Sunday, which opens the occupation of Alsace-Lorraine by France. At midnight on that day, he passed away without a single complaint. Little of Vipler's previous experience had prepared him for his fate. He was born 30 year, 32 years earlier in a small town in a hilly region in the center of France. First educated by a devoted mother, he joined the lycée and impressed everyone by his intellectual aptitudes. In 1906, he was accepted both at the École Polytechnique and at the École Normale Supérieure, the two main elite institutions of scientific higher learning in the country at the time. So he chose to go to the École Normale Supérieure, uh, which uh, was the main place where mathematicians were trained at the time in France, still is today. Three, day, three years later, he would, he would succeed in a competitive state, state exam, sorry, l'agrégation, that selected future mathematics teachers, but also most of the people who would lead a university career afterwards. After two years of military service, Vipla started teaching to small children. I like the small ones, was he remembers saying. Meanwhile, he had started to work on a doctoral thesis dealing with functional equations. We don't know much about this work, which was never published in any form. Although we have a few details about Wippler's mathematical work, we can still say that this field of research was very strong then, uh, with among, uh, very popular then among young Normaliens, the student of the Ecole Normale. The French tradition of mathematical analysis was uh, very strong at the time, with mathematical luminaries like Henri Poincaré, Jacques Adamard, and many others, exerting a major influence on young would-be researchers. But research opportunities were scarce, scarce at the time, and Vipler instead started working at the Lycée du Mans in October 1913. In the Necrology, he wrote in 1920 about his friend, Maurice Gevray, who had met him at the École Normale Supérieure, emphasized the only year Vipler spent as a teacher at the Lycée du Mans. From the memories of his former colleagues, Gevray drew a vivid portrait of a young mathematical teacher, characterized by simplicity, modesty, patience, and above all, a great kindness towards his pupil. His, in July 1914, Wippler and a childhood friend of his got married, a happy life seen in front of them. The news of the general mobilization reached Wippler in Switzerland, where their honeymoon had taken the newlyweds. Contrary to many of the students of the École Normale, Wippler was offered the chance of training in the engineering corps. Only in October 1915 did he reach the front line for the first time after more than a year in the war. For the next three years, his life is chronicled by the letters he sent his young wife. He took advantage of a few permissions he had to father two daughters. Fighting in the engineering corps offered a relative protection from the harshest realities of trench warfare. 
But in July 1916, he took part in the attack of the Somme, where he was uh, commended for his conduct on the fire. After a relatively serious boot of illness, which took him away from the front for several months, he reached Verdun in August 1917 and then took part in the last offensive of the war starting September 26, 1918. A few days before he was fatally injured, he wrote to his wife, I'm feeling well in this interesting, active, but not too dangerous life. I'm happy that I was able to reassure you and quiet your worries. From our perspective, the contrast between Wippler's life before the start of the war and on the front is striking. In his obituary, Gevray likewise emphasized the difference between the innocence of his pre-war days and the constant worry that came with, uh, with life, <clears throat> uh, with, fight, uh, with fighting a war, even if not always on the front line. But in the middle of his testimony, Gevray introduced a crucial point of continuity when he, quote, when he quoted sorry, one of, pupils, uh, one of Vipler's pupils, who, although he acknowledged he had never had the chance of meeting his former teacher on the front, saw him, said that he saw him there, always the same, kind and sweet, always calm, during days of rest as well as in the trenches, days and nights, in the wait as well as at the, as at the time of the assault, and kind to his men, as he had always been to his pupils. We will come back to this. In the First World War, <clears throat> it, has always, it has long been recognized as a scientific war. And it is always surprising to realize that so much of the young scientific elite of the belligerent nation was sacrificed in, the, in combat. As the U.S. physicist George K. Burgess would write after a visit to Europe in 1917, pretty much the whole cur curriculum of physical and natural sciences and their applications are, each of them, fundamentally essential in modern warfare. Almost none could be spared, and the war carried successfully. As far as mathematics is concerned, vital sectors... Uh, like uh, the use of artillery, we had uh, an example earlier uh, in the field, <clears throat> relied heavily on the work of some of its practitioners, especially in the field of external ballistics, that is the computational of projectile trajectories in, in the air, but also in aeronautics, statistics, and various areas of mathematical physics. I also would like to point out that uh, I have uh, published last year a paper on 19th century ballistics, so if you want to know the missing, get the gap, <laughs> have an idea of the gap between the two, <laughs> that's a, that's a good place to start. It's in the archive for history of exact uh, science. Um, a little later, in 1919, Burgess, however, felt that the war had had but little effect on science itself. He wrote, while hundreds, if not thousands, of new applications of known principles were due to, the, to war work, one would be hard-pressed to name even two or three new principles developed because of the war. Some of the scientists most involved in the conflict seem to agree, like Émile Borel, the famous French analyst, who had spent two years organizing the whole scientific mobilization of his country. I'll come back to that as well. When he presented his candidacy to the Academy of Sciences in Paris in 1919, a reviewer wrote, the mathematical work of Mr. Borel having been interrupted by the war, I only need to add to my report from 1912 a few words relative to the period from January 1913 to July 1914. So when the war is now remembered at all by mathematicians, its impact on their discipline tends to be downplayed. I've always been struck, however, by the memories produced by the members of the famous Bourbaki group after the First World War. Too young to have fought in the war, mathematicians like Jean Dieudonné or André Veil joined the École Normale Supérieure in the 1920s. A, de a decade later, they form a collective adopting Bourbaki as their pen name, pen name sorry, with the goal of reforming the general outlook of the discipline emphasizing abstraction at the expense of applications, 
and, uh, and looking at the foundation of mathematics. In the 60s, when they started to tell the story of their group, they were becoming older, you know, and it's often the case that older men try to like to tell the, their stories of their youth. They told stories where the First World War played a crucial part. Dieudonné wrote, in the great conflict of 1914-1918, the French considered that everyone should serve on the front, so much so that the young savants, as well as uh, other Frenchmen, did their duty on the front line. The result was a dreadful hecatomb, hecatomb among, French, among young French scientists. As for his friend, André Rouvel, he wrote in his autobiography <clears throat> in 1991, already at, when I was at the École Normale Supérieure, I was deeply struck by the damage wrecked upon mathematics in France by the war. This war had created a vacuum that my own and subsequent generation were hard pressed to fill. To fill, yeah. <clears throat> this impression is an impression I wanted to put to the test of historical scrutiny about the fact whether or not the war had caused such a tremendous effect on French mathematics. What we, what we see here is an accumulation of different perspectives that are at odds with one another, in fact. In the history of mathematics, like all human affairs, diverse viewpoints produce discordant accounts. But in the case of World War I, the process through which stories themselves were constructed seemed to have played a crucial part. This is why we felt it was necessary to re-examine these stories and the way they were produced. In the collected book, uh, my colleague and I uh, co-edited, Catherine Goldstein and, uh, and, and I co-edited in, in 2014, The War of Guns and Mathematics, several authors, including June Barrow Green, uh, underscored the importance of the various roles played by scientists, by mathematicians, and by mathematics during the First World War. Like their colleagues in the physical and medical sciences, mathematicians, we argued in the book, were mobilized in a variety of ways and helped develop new tools, uh, instruments, new weapons, new engines, new protocols that proved crucial to the fighting of the war. We just heard some of these stories. In France, Britain, Italy, and the United States, but also in Russia, Germany, Austria, mathematicians were drafted and volunteered their expertise for defense in a variety of ways. Many examples were developed by our colleagues in the book, showing that mathematicians worked in ballistics, <clears throat> aviation, statistics, etc. Needs for new computing procedures, either numerical or graphical, led to many new developments in this area of mathematics, as well as in probability theory and functional analysis. In the War of Guns and Mathematics, the various roles played by mathematicians in the First World War emerged quite clearly. Roughly speaking, we have outlined four different roles that they were extremely, when they, where they were extremely active, roughly corresponding to their age. First, the youngest one served on active duty, where they were often killed, some of them at least. Second, slightly older mathematicians were, however, often able to use their special skills as mathematicians, serving as experts in a variety of ways, including teaching, and research and development. Third, many would also be called to play active roles on, in the organization of research on local and especially national levels, sometimes international levels as well, sowing the seed of large research bodies that would play an enormous part in the development of a truly nationalized form of scientific research after the war. And finally, Many mathematicians also played prominent parts in intellectual debates about the fate of science, culture, and society during and after the World War I. Most historical research until now had focused on the three latter roles. Here, I will try to argue that even young scientists who died on the front line, unfortunately without leaving much of a trace often, deserve to be studied in detail. In my recent book, published just a few days ago, actually, whose title may be translated as Science Leaders Under Fire, I focus on the fate of young mathematicians who served and died as soldiers during the First World War. Uh, 
I revisit the apparent contradiction between pre-war training and wartime service and examine some of its long-term effects. As I hinted at by telling Wippler's story, the contradiction which seemed to have been perceived during the conflict was mostly worked out through writing. Although they are often difficult to read because of the raw emotion they steered in the reader, the many stories told, told about young scientists who were killed during the war seem to provide a crucial insight into the way in which the experience of the war impacted people, people's conception of science and mathematics. Having analyzed at, line, at length this type of resource over the past few years, especially in the case of the young mathematician of the Ecole Normale Supérieure, I would, I would now like to argue that these stories played an important role in the emergence of a new, more abstract form of mathematics, which could be morally detached from Wharton uses of mathematics. It helps to understand the important roles played by mathematicians, th th that important role played by mathematicians. To understand the important role played by mathematicians, it helps to understand that the discipline was differed in, different in many ways from contemporary perceptions of it. Abstract mathematics was a recent invention then, and though research at the professional level already was extremely technical, most mathematicians were at least partly trained in applied mathematics, having been exposed to descriptive geometry, general and celestial mechanics, as well as technical drawings, for example. And in so far as it was informed by the sciences, military training was more often than not quite mathematical. Most develop, in most developed nations, the last decades before the start of World War I had witnessed the strong development of autonomous universities where mathematicians often played prominent roles. While mathematical culture spread across campuses to several other domains of science and engineering, mathematicians felt more and more entitled to pursue their own research agenda, over which they exerted more and more control. Consequently, the traditional connection between mathematicians and military men, men had loosened up slightly, but would be quite quickly re-established once the war was declared. But at first, some mathematicians experienced forms of rejection. Let me take the case of Jules Hague, later to become a great expert in dynamical systems theory. The, a reader at the, in mathematics at the University of Clermont-Ferrand before the war he was serving in the Michelin Tire Company, transformed into a bomb factory at the time. As late as uh, September 1915, he could still write that in the eyes of his superior, his mathematical skills had very little value. In a letter he wrote to his professor, Paul Appel, at the Academy of Sciences in Paris, I complained, I am in their eyes nothing more than a mathematician, with no practical usefulness, other than occasionally serving as a computing machine. In his spare time, Hag had, however, developed a new approach to estimate, uh, to approximate computing errors made in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the approximation of some ballistic theories. Um, despite the fact that it might contain sensitive material, the paper he sent to Appel was published by the Academy of Sciences. Locally, the, pers the person who was most, most interested in reading it was General, General Jules Charbonnier, the head of the Gavre Commission since uh, 1906. So uh, the paper I was right talking uh, uh, earlier about this paper, about this commission. The story of this commission which was founded in 1830. It was the main, at the time, the main research institution of the French Navy in charge of ballistics. In August 1914, all men and officers serving at, the, at, the, at this commission, at Gavre, it's on the coast of Brittany, near Lorient, if you know where that is. Uh, they were, most of those men were, were sent to active duty, except five officers, who of course had requested other position, but this was refused to them. But as we know, after the first week of the war, fighting conditions changed drastically. Indeed, the front line of the Western Front was stabilized from Switzerland to the North Sea, and, fi and fighting took the form of a siege warfare, warfare 
This was a form of combat in which the expertise of mathematicians had for several centuries already been quite appreciated. New, more powerful artillery guns were produced which, for which range tables needed to be computed. Another crucial aspect of ballistics changed at the time as well. Most tables before the war were computed for low angles of shooting. In trench warfare, guns could be positioned uh, further from the front and used to fire at a distance. They could also be used against airplanes and zeppelins. Mathematical methods which work well at low angles failed for higher ones. At the GAV Commission, new personnel was suddenly badly needed. This is why and how HAG was co called by Charbonnier to help. Together with, the, with a Navy officer, Garnier, and uh, a drafted mathematics teacher, Marcus, HAG developed a new uh, uh, efficient computing procedure, the so-called GHM method, in fact, based on Euler's uh, uh, approximations, which was used by the French army for several decades afterwards. The officer at Gavre produ produced a narrative of this collaboration that is strikingly at odds with the story often told by scientists. You can see a hag in this photo, surrounded by officers, taking a picture of the photograph, photographer. Sorry. Uh, this is a, a rather nice way for me to symbolize the competing accounts produced by the war. While scientists often complained that the army was often not able to take advantage of their unique expertise, officers at Gavre, on the contrary, emphasized the great work of acculturation they successfully carried out. By the end of the war, they proud themselves that civilian mathematicians had been trained and ready to work side by side with officers. Contributors to the war of guns and mathematics <clears throat> have shown that mathematicians were indeed often successfully included in military structures, uh, not least as uh, lecturers. As I said earlier, mathematicians had played very, thus played various roles in the war. When science's role was in this war was called into question, scientists responded with speeches. Constructing stories about science in the war was a task many members of the older generation felt compelled to take on. As early as December 1914, the mathematician Paul Appel, to whom Hag would address his letter just a few months later, gave a moving speech at the Academy of Sciences where he, in which he expressed his worries about the fate of science in this troubled time. In his speech, he emphasized his vision of science, which encompassed much of what we now call application. <clears throat> Contrary to Burgess later, he wished not to delineate too clearly that distinction. To Appel, science incorporates both the pure and the applied, both the atoms and, uh, and the uh, and, uh, airplanes. Sci but, but also, uh, science truly was a moral good. The search for scientific truth, he wrote, by uh, a spirit attached, uh, attracted by moral beauty was the noblest effect that a human life can undertake. But in the first war, months of the war, sorry, but the first months of the war had shaken this belief. He underscored that some had hijacked science with over-specialization, willful power, and a narrow focus on practical effectiveness. To him, this led to a hard, selfish, materialistic civilization, to some kind of, and I quote, scientific barbarity, barbarie savante, like the one that had taken over Germany. What we have to underscore here is the fact that this expression, barbarie savante, scientific barbarity, would have seen oxymoronic just a few months earlier. Science led to civilization. Lack of science was barbarous. Now, a door, a door as at open had the door had opened, allowing for the emergence of something unthinkable before. Was science then a word without meaning? Appel asked rhetorically, An, a, hypotric, a hypo, hypocritical delusion? No, he answered. We must answer no, a thousand times no. A response to that threat was to stigmatize German science. 
The mathematician Emile Picard was especially vocal in this regard. In 1915, he published a book under the patronage of the Academy titled The History of Science and the Pretensions of German Science, in which he chastised the scientists of the opposing nation for having stolen much of their invention from, from France and England. For him, German science was somehow, parad somehow, somewhat paradoxically, suffered from an exacerbated at at attraction towards abstraction, while at the same time being too informed by applications. German science, he wrote, had this, has the tendency to posit a priori notion and concept and to follow indefinitely the consequences without worrying about their agreement with reality, and not even while taking and, and even while taking pleasure from distancing itself from common sense. This was one of the roots of its brutal uh, manifestation on the battlefield for Picard. As I already said, the response in France, like in all other belligerent countries, was massive scientific and industrial mobilization. In 1915, a mathematics professor at the Sorbonne, Paul Painlevé, entered the government as Minister of Education and Inventions for National Defense. Penlevé's pupil, the scientific director of the École Normale Supérieure, Émile Borel, whom you may remember as the mathematician whose work was said to have been interrupted by the war, was named Director of Inventions for National Defense. And he organized a government body to oversee the scientific mobilization. The direction examined over the course of the war more than 9,000 projects, and seven in 81 of them, very precisely, were developed and passed on to the army. After the war, this direction became the Office for Invention, Industrial, and Scientific Research. In 1939, it would become the, the National Center for Scientific Research, the CNRS, which is still the biggest research institution in France. Let us jump now to 1918. In the after the fall of his uh, uh, government in 19, also I forgot to yes I forgot to to, to specify that Penlevé served in government for for three years, or a bit a bit more than two years. He became uh, war minister in 1917, and for a brief period of time, one or two months, he was even uh, he served even as the prime minister at the time where the prime minister had the most uh, power in the French government. But in 1917, his government fell. He was replaced by Clemenceau, as we, uh, we know. And uh, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he then served, uh, he stepped out of government, and he served as president of the Academy of Science in 1918. He was in a good position to underline the lessons of the war, as people were keen to draw them at the time. In several moving speeches, he went over the experience of the past four years. Significantly, he, um, he, he presented a striking vision of the war as a deadly fight between two conceptions of civilization. And I quote here, whether science would be for humans the means of their liberation or the instrument of their enslavement. In Penlevé's view, Science, therefore, had ceased, in a sense, to be for the moral good. But contrary to Picard, he did not want to oppose a French and a to a German science. To him, science was one, and it, but it was morally neutral. Like Aaron, he said, it could be used for good and evil, to harvest and to kill. For this reason, Penlevé believed that science had to be developed by a superior elite. We are now left with a new contradiction, of which Penlevé must have been acutely aware. On the one hand, scientific mobilization for defense had proven absolutely essential for the pursuit of war. On the other, the higher conception of science as a mean to elevate human spirit was reaffirmed as a crucial lesson to be taken out of the war. My latest book, therefore, aims at untangling this apparent contradiction by fo focusing on stories told about mathematicians killed in war. It shows how the speeches made at the Academy of Sciences resonated with wider sentiments about the proper place of scientists in war. Uh, 
As we have seen, the heavy mortality of students among students and scientists struck imaginations. As early as January 1915, uh, at a meeting of the alumni of the École Normale Supérieure, the director of the school said that of the 195 currently enrolled students who had gone to war, only more than a quarter, 55 of them, were safe. That was five, that was five months into the war. Already 35 had been killed, 15 had disappeared, 74 were wounded, 21 had been taken prisoners, and 9 had fallen ill. The numbers and the, speech, the speeches delivered on that occasion were printed in the press. This was one of the first evidences, generally, that circulated beyond censorship concerning the toll the war had taken on the French army during the first disastrous month of fighting. As far as mathematicians were concerned, already 14 had been killed at the time. Over the years, eight more would be killed on the battlefield or because of wounds received there. These 22 mathematicians amount to one and a half times the number of science students admitted at the École Normale Supérieure in any given year at the time. To the French Mathematical Society uh, in uh, 1914, 178 mathematical, mathematics teacher or professor belong at the time. So 22 is a, is, is, is a, is a significant proportion of that. <clears throat> and it's not counting the young students who did not have time to complete their studies uh, before they died. To better seize the impact of this uh, loss, we may look more precisely at the proportion of science students and alumni of the École Normale killed at war by year of promotion. From this graph, it is obvious that it was the youngest Normaliens who were decimated. From the, for, the year, for the three years, 1910 to 1912, the, the year of promotion, it's actually the year of, of entrance at the school, uh, more than half of the class died in war, more than half of the class. This doesn't count the wounded, prisoners, and other types of casualties. Other promotions from 1903 onwards were less, but still significantly affected. Alumni, who were above 30 years old, more or less, at the start of the war, had, however, very little chance of being killed while performing their military duty. Comparison with the other populations, like people from the Ecole Polytechnique or even the general, uh, general French population have shown that scientists from the Ecole Normale suffered greater casualty rate proportionally when they were students, but not afterwards. In fact, much less if they were older. The difference between generation was sometimes lost in the memories of the conflict and only the great sacrifice of the Ecole would later be remembered. But numbers alone don't tell a story. As I suggested, it was the stories told by the young, uh, about the young men killed in war that in the end informed much memories, uh, and for the, in, oh, sorry, inform, uh, memories much more than pure numbers, even if paradoxically only the numbers were, were in the end retained by those memories. In a long held tradition, it is a long held tradition at the Ecole Normale Supérieure to publish obituaries of deceased classmates. The short notices devoted to students killed in war therefore provide great documentary evidence for their short life and subsequent death. I would like to emphasize their, the exceptionality of having at our disposal this sort of materials. Young students were given the same treatment as distinguished professors who died at the end of a long career. The documents analyzed therefore provide a very rich and indeed lively source about the life and work of young mathematicians at the, at the start of the century. I'll turn to, that, to those stories now. You can see here Joseph Martin's curriculum vitae, his CV. It shows a typical trajectory followed by the students before they were admitted to the Ecole Normale. After a few years in several of France's lycées, they often spend two years in preparatory classes, sometimes in Paris. At the Ecole, they studied hard with some of the world's best mathematicians. 
Typically, they would pass the teacher's exam, l'agrégation, after three years of study. They would then go, um, go to military service for two years, usually, and uh, after which they would either get funding for research or would be sent to, cheat in, to teach sorry, in some provincial lycée. Some, like Marty here, would do some research and try to publish their result. This manuscript was sent to the Academy of Sciences, <laughs> heavily edited afterwards, I think, before it was published. It contained new results about important topic of functional analysis, uh, um, uh, the, 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 so the, the theory of freedom equations, which was discussed by many mathematicians at the time, introducing a, a, a way of a, a symmetriza, symmetriza, symmetrical, to, a way to have symmetrical kernel, which would be used uh, in the, in the nine, up to the 1960s by some of the other mathematicians. Of the 22 mathematics students uh, I've uh, studied, two had already defended a doctorate. One was a university professor, the other working on, in an observatory. Six more had published some interesting research. Four uh, have been identified as working on a doctorate, of which we know little. The most famous of them, perhaps, is René Gatto. Uh, he's on the left of this picture, taken in a room, in a study room at the Ecole Normale before the war. His work on what is now called the Gatto Integral was published by a young survivor uh, after, he, after Gatto himself died on the Western Front on October 2nd, 1914. Stories told about those mathematicians are moving and it is sometimes impossible to go over them without be, being deeply affected by the tragedy of each of these lives. They are however constructed during the war to serve many purposes. There are obvious ways for many of the writers to grieve a painful loss, the painful loss of a close friend. They are of course meant to pay tribute to young men who after having uh, been exceptionally successful in their studies had engaged in careers in mathematics either as teachers or researchers and often both. Together, they paint a group picture which would significantly shape the meaning of the war as far as scientists who took part in it were concerned. To me, once raw emotion is put aside, uh, we have here the wedding announcement of one of them, the most uh, striking aspect of these accounts remain the portrayal of these young men as modest, hardworking family men devoted to their students as well as to their small children and wives. Like in Wippler's obituary, with which I started this talk, page after page are devoted to painstakingly descri describing uh, the care with which the, most of them had embraced uh, their calling as teachers. In some rare occasion, other sentiment emerge from these stories. They usually serve to underscore internationalist engagements, like Théophile Rousseau's heavy involvement in the Inspiranto movement before the war, here at the Bern International Congress in 1913, where he played an important part as part of the board of directors. Or, much less frequently still, their defiance towards German mathematics. A few of them were present at the Cambridge International Congress of Mathematicians in 1912. Of course, all of these uh, qualities translate into great, translated into great assets once the war is decla was declared. Mostly, in the obituaries again, they are portrayed as going to battle with resignation. There is little jingoistic enthusiastic, uh, enthusiasm there, but no hesitation either about where their duty lied. <laughs> Alfred Ballong here, uh, uh, took the time to pose in front of the photographer before he left. But it is said that he pleaded not to be separated from his men when they were sent to the front where he would die. Just like it was uh, pointed earlier concerning Wippel, the Normalien appeared to have transferred to the men serving under them the mixture of kindness and rigor that uh, they had formerly reserved to their pupils.
Some died quickly, like Georges Léry on September 10, 1914, not a month after he started fighting, in massive offensives by the German, uh, uh, the, by the German army on badly prepared French regiments. Some were heroically killed, like Jean Piglowski, who died on February 18, 1915, at the, uh, uh, at the head of a small machine gun unit after putting up such a resistance that German soldiers were said to have built a steel on his grave. You can imagine the effect those stories can have in public discourses. Public discourses were produced uh, on the basis of those uh, intimate uh, uh, obituary right after uh, they were published. A whole new genre of literature emerged around the figure of the chef, the leader, who uh, those uh, young intellectuals had proven to be. Often criticized before the war, the intellectual seemed to be rehabilitated by this experience. France, after all, had withstood the shock of the invading army. Slowly, the broken promise of their mathematical career took over. In the case of the young Paul Lambert, barely 21 when he was killed on March 13, 1915, his classmate Gaston Julia, himself heavily wounded in the face just two months earlier, who would become one of the important mathematicians of that period in, in Paris, felt compelled to compare his fate to, uh, to Lambert's fate, to Évariste de Galois the young mathematical genius who had died in a duel in, 19, in 1832. Like for Gâteau, many of the survivors work at, publish, at publishing material uh, Nach classes, which would soon fall, however, in relative oblivion. The work of Jean Clairet on Beclung equation, for example, transformation, sorry, would, for example, be picked up only uh, in the 1970s by a US physicist. Among the scientists who started to organize the scientific mobilization, like Pinlevin, like Pinlevin, sorry, and delivered speech as speeches at the academy, like Picard, the impression left by the massacre was very strong. Some of them lost children, students, in the fighting. The stories picked up by, from obituaries would receive a wide echo in the press. Prices were given to fallen soldiers of, at the academy. More and more young scientists were relieved from the various dangerous posts and sent to laboratories and teaching centers. For many, this only came after they had been injured once, twice, three times sometimes. Many served in sound-ranging sections organized by Borel to implement an idea developed by scientists at the direction of inventions, consisting in locating enemies' batteries by triangulating their position by the sounds they emitted. Some of them, some of the, universe, some of the young Normaliens, famously located the Le Paris or Canon, uh, falsely uh, uh, known as the Big Bertha now, uh, which were the German, with which the Germans bomb, bombed Paris in 1917. By the end of the war, it seemed clear that many of the Ecole Normale, that, too many, sorry, that it seemed clear to many that the Ecole Normale had paid a heavy tribute to the defense of the nation. While the training they had received had prepared them well to play a crucial part in fighting, their intellectual aptitude had commanded them to authorities. Henceforth, young scientists would serve as scientists, or, at or not as soldiers, or at least, if they were uh, to, be, to be serving as soldiers, they would be put in the artillery, where they would be less exposed. In ceremonies, like the first time students were readmitted to the school in March 1919, or at the inauguration of the war monument in 1923, which I've shown, uh, post-war memories of, at the Ecole Normale were cultivated on a dual basis. On the one hand, the sacrifice of the Ecole was underscored, as well as the loss to science that uh, represented by all these broken lives. On the other, the Ecole was reaffirmed in its mission as the main defender, and I quote from the president's speech at that time, free research and disinterested science of the Pacific and civilizing mission. 
of post-war France. By contrast, the École Polytechnique represented the adjustment made to those ideals during the war, a heavy investment in the de development of new applications of the sciences to industrial and military purposes. This is one way the contradiction was resolved, by giving roles, specific roles to specific institutions. In the 20s, the young men who, form, who studied mathematics at the École Normale, among whom the ones who would form the Bobaki group a decade later, encountered some such discourses. They had to attend those ceremonies. Interestingly, those who would steadfastly oppose their elders', their elders view of mathematics would in fact pick up rather uncritically the discourse of their alma mater. Mathematics students killed in war were a tragedy pure and simple for them. The sense of this sacrifice being by and large lost to this generation. Their goal now was clear. They should, themse they should devote themselves only to pure mathematical research, above all. Stories told about mathematicians killed in war, even if the Bobaki chose not to remember them per se, had fulfilled their role. Even while military scientific research was activi actively promoted by the state, a space for pure, neutral science was open to them. To me, this is one of the most lasting consequences of World War I. Thank you.